With every match, a warrior is born. Step inside the ring. This is the Whip Podcast with your host, devastating Daryl Pace and Deshaun Whip Dog Whipple. Special. You've had Vince Russo. You've had John Cena Jr. I'm senior. You've had Gilbert. You've had Super Mex. Mm-mm-mm. Because, see, for those guys to be successful, you need somebody that understands what they do. And on this episode, I have the best selling author, I have the wrestling historian, Mr. Keith Elliott. Greenberg. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Whip, and um, yeah, I, I'm overjoyed to be in such esteemed company as Gilberg and John Cena Sr. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I'm just saying. They might be here, but you a little bit up here. I'm just saying. Just saying. Well, guys, first and foremost, I want to welcome this guy on the show. He is the author of the brand new book, and I have a copy right here. Fall of the Buzzards, Pro Wrestling in the Age of COVID-19. Now, I'm going to tell you, Keith, this book has a very special meaning to me to start off with. Because, well, let me start off. Keith, where are you from? I'm from New York City my entire life. You're from New York City. Um, well, I'm from Detroit. And there's a very significant, and you talked about it in your book, as it relates to pro wrestling and COVID-19 in Detroit. I'm also a trivia host here, and we were giving away uh, a gift tickets to Little C's Arena for SmackDown. I was all prepared to go to that event. I also do radio, had a whole set up there. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Why didn't that happen, Keith? It didn't happen because... On March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization, or WHO, declared an international pandemic. Yes, they did. So uh, we had the the people that we gave free tickets to, obviously they couldn't go. I mean, at this point, we all were very hurt. I know I was. Keith, don't call me a mark, man, but I'm a big Roman Reigns fan. So I was like, man, I could have finally got to see the Tribal Chief live, but I didn't get to do it, man. But... Besides that, I actually started this podcast during the wrestling COVID time because obviously a lot of the pro wrestlers were at home, so they had a lot more time to be able to do these podcasts, which is why I was blessed to have some great uh, guests on the show. Now, I want to really dive into the book itself, but I want to go into one thing before. Like, I was talking to a good buddy of mine, Rob Hokeman. He's a former writer over there at WWE. And he was, you know, and I know this as well, you're a very big wrestling historian, man, but where did it start for you? I got it. I like to always start with that. This love it, start, it started with my very early childhood. You know, like many people listening to this show, I watched wrestling with my grandparents. Now, uh, this was in, I, I was born in 1959, so this would have been in the early 1960s, and this was a time when it certainly wasn't characterized as sports entertainment and my grandparents were immigrants from the former soviet union and they uh they were true believers and that's how i grew up watching wrestling and then when i went to school and people told me it wasn't all legit those were fighting words yeah because not only were you condemning professional wrestling you were questioning the intelligence of my ancestors uh, very much so, man. And uh, when you say that, it's always one thing that happens to guys like that because I'm 42 myself. And, you know, we grow up, we're really deep into pro wrestling. But, you know, as you get older, you think it's going to die down. You know, right, what I mean? you get you're, a, you're, you're supposed to start, you know, <laughs> dating girls or right. something <laughs> preposterous like that. So, when did you realize? Yeah, my love for wrestling is a little bit different than the normal well, guy. Well, you know, I did backslide, you know, oh, um, around around college. Okay. You know, I wasn't watching it week to week anymore. And, I, you know, I started going out with girls and focusing on other things. But I would, I never divorced myself from it completely. 
I never turned my back on professional wrestling. So I can remember having a girlfriend in around 1980 or so and going to see Harley Race against Barb Backlund at Madison <laughs> Square Garden, champion versus champion. So it's not like I was completely disinterested in professional wrestling. I just wasn't as devoted to it. And then, you know, I assumed my enthusiasm would remain casual as other things came into my life. But as I, but I remember there was one day, and now this is a couple of years later, I turn on the TV one Saturday morning and Buddy Rogers had a segment called Rogers Corner. And this was, you know, a precursor to Piper's Pit. You know, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers was a very flamboyant fellow. Um, you know, Ric Flair uh, certainly took part of his Nature Boy persona from Nature Boy Buddy mm -hmm. Rogers. He was a former champion, the first Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion. And, and I was compelled. And once I started watching that, I was, I, I was addicted again. It's yeah. like, you know, somebody who says they're going to quit smoking and they're at a bar and they grub a cigarette outside from, you know, because they've had a few drinks. And, you know, a week later, they're a pack a day smoker again. Uh, I understand, man. I understand. I think I was the same way. When I started dating, I'm like, uh, it would always still trigger my mind, no matter if I was on a date or not. Monday night, it's nine o'clock. There's something on television. Even if I wasn't in front of a television, you know, it always kind of, that Monday night raw always triggered in my head. But with that being said, man, you, you go on and you had another previous book and you talked about the Indies. Um, yes. That was a, a great book as well. But what really made you say, you know what? I'm going to talk about this whole COVID-19 pro wrestling era. Like, I'm glad you did because it was something that we thought we would never see. And we were actually living in it, but nobody else has really touched it. Like we all try to act like it never happened. What right, I mean, and that, that's a lot easier to do. You know, you mentioned my indie book, Too Sweet Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution. Um, I completed that book and the book ends with essentially the first broadcast of, of AEW Dynamite. So now I knew I needed to write a sequel. Now, I didn't realize there would be a pandemic. I thought the sequel would be about what happened to indie wrestling. Did, you know, did it, WWE and AEW sign up all the indie wrestlers and did it kill the indies? Or did the indies get stronger because there were two choices? And did all these indie guys in, w, in, in AEW, you know, Oh, did they make a dent into the WWE empire? That's what I thought the book would be. And, and I knew there was an American presidential election coming. I knew that Brexit would be occurring in the UK. So I said, I'll juxtapose this with real world events. And, you know, there was a, a book that was later a, a, a mini series on ESPN called Ladies and Gentlemen, The Bronx is Burning about the 1977 New York Yankees. And they tell the story of the New York Yankees, but then they switch to the Son of Sam killings in New York at the same time. And they, they switch to all the looting during the New York City blackout at the same time. And so I like, this is the way I wouldn't mind conducting this. And then um, by the time I finished the epilogue for Too Sweet Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution, the pandemic had been declared. And I spoke with my executive editor, Michael Holmes, and we decided, yeah, this is going to be a book about pro wrestling in the COVID era. Nice, nice. And you already touched on it. I didn't know if I was going to go there, but since you touched on it, you opened the book with drawing a relationship between Donald Trump, the election, and pro wrestling. What really was the thought process? I know you kind of touched on it just then, but... You know, obviously, because of the world that we live in, people can see you bring it up Trump and then they say, oh, my God, this is political. I don't want to be a part of this. I mean, look, I don't consider this a political book. I consider this book a snapshot of the time. But I make the point in chapter one and you read it, you know, uh, things were so confusing. We didn't know what was real and what was wrestling. And certainly having people like Boris Johnson in the U.K., 
and Donald Trump in positions of power even added to that confusion yeah. because, you know, uh, even if you are a Trump supporter, you must concede that the pronouncements of Trump were quite colorful and did seem like something you'd hear in a wrestling promo. The difference was that during this very unique period, neither WWE nor AEW ever uttered the name of the WWE Hall of Famer because it, it was such a polarizing time that no one wanted to alienate half of their audience. Interesting, other things came up. You know, Mark Henry, um, uh, uh, um, the guys in the New Day, uh, Keith Lee, they were allowed to wear singlets and armbands yeah. uh, uh, honoring the victims of encounters with police and encouraging people to pursue the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, uh, Randy Orton gave money to Black Lives Matter. John Cena gave money to Black Lives Matter. So these were issues that were happening at the time, real things. And wrestling wasn't 100% an escape from this stuff. And in this era where we accept that this is these aren't the days of my grandparents, we accept that these are human beings with intelligent thoughts who are not the characters they play on TV. You know, wrestlers would debate the Black Lives Matter movement on Twitter. Yes. Uh, you know, Mustafa Ali was very outspoken in favor of the Black Lives Matter movement. So all of that was in front of us. And how could I run and hide from it when it was all right there? This is very true, man. And I'm glad you, and I, I'm glad you actually touched on that. Now, I want to kind of go with a timeline a little bit. So... Obviously, you know, you talked about it as well in the book where it, ha it started in Wuhan, China and everything like that. And we talked about Detroit being the first show that was canceled. When you first heard that, how did you feel? Did you, you know, obviously we heard what Trump was saying originally. He said, it'll just be two weeks. That's it. But how did you feel? Did you think this is a lot bigger than we were getting? No, to talk about? I, I didn't. I didn't think it would be. And I explained this in the book. You know, we had gone through you know, other international pandemics. You know, there was the SARS outbreak in, in the early 2000s. And um, somehow I didn't really think it would be as heavy as it was. And I can remember my full-time job, I work as a television producer and I was working at NBC News at the time. And there was a editor from France and, you know, I walked into his edit room and I'm like, look at this. I'm showing him my phone. They've closed all the cafes in Paris. And I'm like, the cafes are, are, are an indispensable part of Paris. It's inconceivable that they do this. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I think the same thing's going to happen over here. And I'm like, really? Nah, not over here. Lo and behold, it did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Are you familiar with uh, Jim Galley or works over there at N uh, NWA? He's one of their announcers, but I, I bring him up because he also works in the news. And I interviewed him, and he was talking about how, at that time, every story on television was COVID-related, if you remember like, that. I realize working in the news business, there's sometimes a lot of hysteria being generated. And so I think it's natural, especially if you've been on these stories yourself, to take a step back and saying, is it really as bad as it seems? Is it really going to happen over here? And then, you know, we look at like WWE. Would the great, you know, majestic Vince McMahon ever cancel WrestleMania? Impossible. And exactly is where, that's exactly where I want to go for the next part of this timeline. And, and you know, I, I hate to, when I do these, I, I go so deep into the book. I don't want to give away everything, but I want to touch on certain things. I don't mind because <laughs> if, if people are interested in the topic, they're going to buy the book for and sure. they're going to, you know, we're, we're not going to read a 300 page book 
during <laughs> you know, during a one hour podcast. This is true. Even though I got some time, no, I'm joking. But but I do agree. So we go forward. Um, and obviously you talked about it in the book. They're building up AJ Styles versus Undertaker. They're building up all these matches. But then, I, as you also stated, some of the wrestlers were starting to talk about, will there even be a WrestleMania? And we know big Vince McMahon, Vinnie Mac, he held off to the very last minute. So as we're moving down the timeline and getting closer and closer to that Tampa WrestleMania, what are you thinking then? Are you thinking they're going to pull the plug? You know, I, at first I was thinking not, but then, you know, I'm talking to people who, friends of mine who are wrestling fans who live internationally. And like, I know the Japanese can't get to the U.S. And then my friends in the United Kingdom can't get to the U.S. And it's like, wait, this is like a big part of WrestleMania, all those international fans. And then, you know, the, the, government officials are meeting about this like whether or not Vince McMahon wants to stage Wrestlemania there are others who are making decisions about what is safe so then I'm thinking will Wrestlemania be canceled I mean the NBA was canceled yep. for a while you know Major League Baseball there was no spring training going on so is this going to happen too and then once we, at a certain stage, I realized WWE hadn't done it yet, but they were going to pull the plug yeah. because all of the indie events surrounding WrestleMania were canceled. And then it was a question of when will WrestleMania take place? In my mind, not having, you know, foresight, I thought maybe six weeks, maybe it's six weeks away. You know, let the pandemic play its course It'll probably be over in a month or so, and then we can move on. For sure, for sure. Now, one thing that a lot of people question, you talked about the NBA being shut down, and obviously pro wrestling kept going on. You talked about this on Busted Open with LaGreca, Mickey James, and uh, Tommy Dreamer, who are also in the book as well. But I want to ask you, you personally, did you feel like they should have continued pro wrestling? Like they should have kept, or should they have shut it down? I mean... I was grateful to have pro wrestling week to week. Um, I was, you know, confused about how they were able to pull this off. I had questions over how these people would remain safe. I mean, you know, we have to remember what it was like before so many people were vaccinated. And we all remember, you know, I mean, you know, now every week, a couple of friends are diagnosed with COVID. Triple H had COVID for the, the recent Raw. And, you know, I'm sure he's back at work three or four days later. So, you know, but this is not how the world was at the time. Right. And had Triple H come down with COVID in March or April 2020, he's had health issues that were well yep. publicized. We'd be worried about him. So I was trying to figure out how are the wrestlers going to remain safe? Now, WWE said they were taking every precaution. I'm sure they spent the money to be as safe as possible. Right. They were trying to isolate the talent as effectively as possible, only bringing people to the performance center to take their matches when it was essential. So... I, you know, I guess they kind of knew what they were doing. And then there were things they didn't know. And there were always rumors that I'd hear, you know, and I'd be talking like you, you started your podcast during COVID-19. Yeah, I was talking to people who were wrestlers who were just sitting at home. And you'd hear, oh, there was a big outbreak at WWE you've never heard about. Oh, Tony Khan will never tell you about <laughs> the 12 people who had COVID there last yeah. week. And those were rumors. That was right. gossip. Yeah, very much so. I Because I know I've heard those. It was a party over here. And the guys got in tr uh, sick at the party. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, another thing that happened during that time period, and, you know, we talked about in the book, Sammy Callahan. Uh, and you talked about Triple H. Roman Reigns. Some of these guys literally said, damn that. I'm not going out there until we know right. what the hell is going on. What did you think about that? I mean, that's their prerogative. 
That is their absolute right to do that. And they're not doing it because they're afraid of the physicality of getting in the ring. Nobody knew what was happening. You know, there were some people, look, I continued taking the subway. Other people who were my friends would not do that. You know, there was a period of a couple of weeks. I remember there was like one month where I didn't like renew my Metro card. So it was, a, it was probably a couple of weeks where I guess I was just staying close to home. Uh, you know, the, and the streets were empty, as you re, as you recall. Yeah. But then, you know, first I started taking sporadic rides on the subway. And then it's like, you know what? It's an easy way to get around New York City. And I would ride the subway and there'd be nothing but homeless people there. You know, I continued to, um, you know, for work, I had to fly to different cities occasionally. And, you know, I'd get to Newark Airport and there'd only be two terminals open because you'd have a flight going to Atlanta and a flight going to Minneapolis and wherever you were going, you transferred from there. But most people I knew were not getting on planes and were not using mass transit. And so I, I didn't judge them for that. And, you know, Sammy Callahan was thinking of his health and his family. Yeah. Roman Reigns had, you know, just beaten leukemia for the second time. Who's going to condemn Roman Reigns for trying to protect himself? And Roman Reigns' wife was pregnant with their second set of twins. You know, are you going to say he's a bad guy for not wrestling? Or are you going to say he's a good guy for thinking of his family first? Very much so. Very much so. By the chance, did you ever get uh, COVID-19? Um, you know, it's funny you ask that. I think that there was one period when the Omicron uh, variant came in where I couldn't even buy a home health care test. You know, like I went to the drugstore. They weren't selling it. There were lines everywhere. There were lines like down the block to get COVID tests on the street in New York City. And so I'd say it was it was a period of several weeks. Now, I was... Was I? I was vaccinated by then. Okay. I had been vaccinated. Uh, you know, I I was fully vaccinated at that stage, and I was also boosted, and okay. uh, and so during that period, my mother, who's in a nursing home, she was diagnosed with COVID, and she was asymptomatic. So I could have had it during that period when you know I wasn't checking, but I was never really sick with covid okay good deal good to hear good to hear what about you uh yeah and i i'm gonna tell you this um and keith i can tell talking to you we're the same type of guy like this we enjoy life meaning you're used to moving around you the industry you're in the industry i'm in you're used to moving around it was hard for me to be locked into the house obviously we had to do it however i i did move a little bit and i still <laughs> feel bad about this I had just, I went to Dallas for WrestleMania and all that. had no problem. I get back here. When it starts opening up a little bit, a friend of mine says, let's go to the bar. I say, cool. Two days later, I have this really bad headache. I'm like, well, maybe I had too many drinks. Three days later, and it's funny wrestling. We're talking about this. They were showing the Stone Cold A&E documentary at the drive-in here. I'm going to it, but I'm not really feeling too good. But I'm in a car. My friend calls me and says they have COVID-19. Damn. I go get tested the next day, and unfortunately, yeah. So to answer your question, yes, so you I were vaccinated know. by that, but I was already vaccinated and boosted as well. So, so and, you, you know, weren't, so so you weren't in the emergency room, right? You know, you weren't on a ventilator. Like you stayed home, you stayed away from people, and you yeah. got better. And yes. that's the big difference now. Now I know somebody who recently <laughs> was hospitalized, but I, he's never confirmed this to me. But I am certain he is unvaccinated, just with, based on other statements he's made about the government being in everybody's business. <laughs> I know that he's not vaccinated, and he was sick for a month. But the average person we know yep. who is vaccinated is not sick for a month. That the is average true. person is sick for a couple of days now. Because we're vaccinated. Absolutely. And I totally agree. Like you just talked about Triple H. He's probably ready for work right now. You know what I'm and saying? And he may be working right now. And he was probably working from home. 
Exactly. Exactly. Now, going forward, you know, let's let's move forward to you know we're talking about the United States and pro wrestling, but Japan was like totally through. Like, I think I read your book. They pretty much said if it wasn't for Wrestle Kingdom, which they made so much, they generated so much money. Then they were able to sustain. Right, they might but, not have been able to stay in business. I mean, it's right. shocking. We're talking about New Japan, the biggest promotion in Asia, and they shut down. You know, they shut down for months. And even, you know, I had this talk today with somebody. They were not allowing people to cheer at the arenas because it would spread bacteria. And I'm still not 100% certain that ban has been lifted. Yeah, I think B Bully was saying literally it's still, or either him or Lance Archer, I can't remember which one said it, but it's still a little funny over there yeah, compared to how it yeah. used to be. Yeah, yeah. Now, you talked a little bit in the book also, you know, we went to the Thunderdome era. Do you consider that non-canon? Meaning like, you know, it happened, we needed wrestling to watch, but uh, it's not really part of our history. What do you think? No, about? it's part of our history. I mean, it, it's all part of our history. We went through it together. The cinematic matches at, at WrestleMania 36 are part of our history. Drew McIntyre holding the championship twice in and winning them in new arenas with no fans in it, that's part of our history. And the Thunderdome was a very creative and costly way yeah. to replicate the fan experience during a time when it was unsafe to have one. Right. Yeah, this is true. This is true. And I know, because I know you talk to a lot of the refs, a lot of the workers, talking to them during that time, and you, you touched a little bit about it in your book. Well, actually a lot, but talk about how they felt performing in front of, First, no fans, and then like the Thunderdome or an AEW where they perform in, in front of their colleagues as fans. Well, you know, like in um, on the indie level, and I spoke to indie guys, and I went to indie shows before the vaccine was out, but those were outdoor shows, the ones I went to, um, where people were, you know, sat in, in pods, so they were trying to control the spread of, of you know, the virus. You know, guys were talking about, you know, how strange it was. I mean, Sammy Guevara says he felt like he was transported back in a time machine to an era when he was performing on indies for no fans. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Trey Miguel spoke to me about having to perform to the camera rather than to the audience. You know, they had to alter their thinking. And I'm fairly positive they never got that same rush that you get in front of a live crowd. But they did their best, and they should be commended for it, all of them. I totally agree. Listen, Keith, many years ago, I was an independent wrestler. So seeing no fans, I was like, hey, you can go ahead and book me right now. I'm just saying. I'm used to it. No, I'm joking. But I say that to say, moving forward, um, you also talked about how when they first start letting fans back in and – half arenas 25 percent arenas and you talked about what dreamer and some of the guys said in the book what do you think about that man and, and, and watching it as a viewer seeing limited fans in the building how did you feel well i mean it wasn't like watching you know what, what we were accustomed to and i've told told this story in other interviews i was watching aw one night with my teenage daughter and uh Lance Archer's like stomping around ringside and he kicks the barricade, but he, he doesn't get a reaction because there's no fans on the other side. And she's like, why did he kick the barricade? There's no fans there to boo him. And I said, because he's figuring it out like everyone else is figuring this all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to go back to the book in a second, but now, Keith, it's time for one of my segments on the show. It is called Book Yourself. Keith, you are a wrestling historian. You're an author. You've been with a lot of the wrestlers. But what Book Yourself is, let's throw that out the window. If Keith Elliott Greenberg could be a part of the pro wrestling world in any era, would you have been a manager? Would you have been a wrestler? Would you have been a booker? What would you have done? And give, my, give me a storyline you think you would have loved to have been a part of. 
I mean, that's a strange thing because <laughs> obviously the reason I became a writer was because I do not possess the athleticism <laughs> to be a wrestler. I do not think I possess the wrestling mind to be a booker. And I do believe that it helps to have been between those ropes in order to be an effective booker because there's an art to physical storytelling that's, you know, as as much as I've written about wrestling, I'm still an outsider. I'm not going to use the pejorative term Mark, although if people want to call me that, I'm okay with it. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's hard to imagine myself as a wrestler. I guess being a manager would be fun, but could I maintain that pattern on a week-to-week -week basis? Or would I pretty much use my best material the first week and then I'd be spent? It's like people who want to do comedy, they want to do stand-up. And, you know, there's a couple of jokes they tell over and over again to their friends, but that's not enough to even sustain an amateur night. Um, so I'm not sure. I've never, I've never envisioned myself other than in my biggest fantasies, you know, being involved. But I, you know, in, in reality, it's just not a place I've ever put myself. I get it. I get it. I get it. Well, <laughs> going back to the book, man. Well, first, what was the first show that you went back to either during the pandemic or post-pandemic? Well, the first show I went back to, and it's chronicled in the book, was an outdoor show, Game Changer Wrestling, GCW, had um, in Indiana on a, uh, in Indianapolis uh, on an afternoon in the summer of 2020. And a lot of wrestlers who were on that show were also, this was the first show they were came back to. And they spoke about that. And they spoke about, they knew that this was going to be more painful than they're accustomed to because, you know, they had ring rust and their, their bodies weren't calloused. But they were so looking forward to just getting in the ring and doing this thing that they love with a crowd there, even though it was a social distant crowd a distance crowd, even though it was a crowd that, you know, it was far less than there was the capacity there, they were still excited to do something in that ring and get fan reaction. And they knew they were making the fans happy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For it sure, was sure. definitely a, a real bond between the fans and the wrestlers at shows like that. I also went to a warrior wrestling show in Chicago Heights that was on a high school football field. And, you know, the wrestlers were appreciative of the fans for turning out. Again, this is before the vaccine. And, you know, the fans were, like myself, were grateful that these wrestlers were risking their health to entertain yeah. us. And I think that definitely showed the, the connection that the wrestlers really had with the fans. I mean, it yes, was amazing. And, and I think that's why you and others were able to create a podcast during this time, because there was this realization when the wrestlers are sitting at home, you know, who are the people responsible for us being here? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's guys like, uh, like, like, uh, you know, it, it's guys like whip, you know, it's, it's these podcasters. It's these people who follow us. It's these people who write about us on the internet. You know, that's who's responsible. And it, I think it deepened that bond. For sure, man. And uh, on the episode you did on Busted Open, you were talking to Mickey James, and she said how even some of those wrestlers, they started OnlyFans, they started Patreons, and you got that one-on-one -on -one interaction that you really might not have gotten prior to the pandemic. Right. I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, the one person I highlight in the book is Danhausen, and realize this is before Danhausen was in um, AEW. The Danhausen was an indie guy, and he was going to some shows, but he was living in Canada, so there were real restrictions. So I think he was only allowed. I think once he came home, he had to quarantine for a week. So he could only work shows every two weeks. And during that time, 
he would go on Patreon and he would go on Cameo and he would go on YouTube and he would sell merch. And this is a guy who had just recently quit his day gig as a nursing assistant and he was able to support his family from that. Man, yeah, absolutely. And you know, as well as I do, that fans like ourselves were happy to dispense that money but yep, to reward absolutely. these guys for what they do for us. Yes, yes. Now, moving forward, it also has changed the scope of wrestling today. Because obviously we have fans going back to the shows. The arenas are full again. But a lot of things have still changed. Would you like to talk about some of the changes that are still in place? From well, like, uh, give me an example of some of the things you see that are changing. Uh, well, I still think they're a lot more accessible than ever. Uh, than they, than yes, they, they are. I, yes, I think that bond didn't, didn't go away. I agree. You know, I, I think the guys, even on the independent circuit, are just doing a lot more stuff now than they ever did before, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, the indies didn't die. Ring of Honor, you know, did. The NWA had to go, kind of go back to the beginning, they lost a lot of their momentum when they were sidelined. Um, but yeah, the Indies are strong. Uh, you know, um, the, a, the the AEW, WWE rivalry, you know, you can't, can't sign every indie wrestler. So, you know, the Indies continue to thrive and it's wonderful to see that. And, you know, I think fans understand how important it is to support the indies because this is where your future stars come from and these guys are working and these women are working for not a lot of money so mm -hmm. you know the indies matter and you know i think like the kinds of people who listen to this podcast you know are more than willing to make that time and not say oh just wait till wwe comes to town <laughs> for sure for sure well i'm not going to hold you too long but i do have a few more questions now the name of the book here is Follow the Buzzards. Obviously, you know, there's a relationship to Bray Wyatt and everything he did. But what made you actually say, and I know as an author, you guys like to leave stuff for interpretation, but what kind of, what made you say Follow the Buzzards as a title anyway? You know, I had been, yeah, yeah, when I, I still am old school. So when I put a book together, I keep files on different topics. I keep paper files, you know, on, on different things I'm going to write about. And um, I uh, had a file on possible titles for the book, you know, titles that best expressed, you know, th the mood of the time. And, you know, in a perfect world, I wanted some term that came up in pro wrestling that would um, e express the sentiments people had during the COVID era. And it was a very anxiety-ridden time where you always felt that there was this dark cloud of uh, illness hovering over us. And so when Bray Wyatt said, follow the buzzards, in other words, the buzzards who circle around when death is near, I thought, you know, that kind of feels right. Makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, it's time for my next segment. And let's shift gears a little bit here, too. It's called the markout moment. Now, when I say that, it's not referencing, oh, my God, I'm going crazy. I met somebody. But being a historian, but also meeting so many guys, being connected, writing about them. Keith, have you ever had that moment you're like, even if you didn't outwardly say it, you're like, man, I can't believe I'm working. Yes, I'm talking yes. to you. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. Um, you know, uh, I remember... When my daughter was a little ki younger kid, I took her to uh, one of the NXT takeovers, okay. and um, Charlotte Flair wrestled. She was was she in NXT? I think she might have. No, she just crossed over to WWE fairly recently, and the audience was introduced to Ric Flair. And my daughter said, "Wow, like look, I can see Ric Flair from where I'm sitting." She goes, "You know." Now I've been in the same building as Ric Flair. Isn't that exciting? And I said, you do know I wrote a book with him. And, and when I said that to her, I thought to myself, I can't believe that. I cannot believe I actually wrote a book with Ric Flair. And when I was writing the book with Ric Flair, 
my phone would ring and I'd look at the phone and it's like, Ric Flair is calling me? Like, how did this happen? You know, and even if we have a disagreement about something, it's like, Ric Flair is mad at me. It's like, pretty cool. Ric Flair is mad at me. <laughs> I love it, man. Nice, man. Nice. Well, since you talked about writing a book, you talked about your lovely daughter as well. I want you to give a quick word to anybody out there that wants to be an author. Um, they see people selling all these books and like, I'm going to make a million dollars. But tell them a really inspiring That's not realistic. Look, Thank you. And, and if, we're, if we're going to invoke, uh, you know, presidents, I remember the start of one school year, President Obama gave a speech to incoming students. And he said, you know, a lot of people think they're going to become a rapper or, or an NBA player or a reality TV star. Well, that's probably not going to happen. And I thought that was very sobering, plain spoken advice. In other words, get an education, learn something. Um, if you think you're going to write a book and become a millionaire, you are living in a dream. That's probably not going to happen. It could, but it probably won't. You write for the love of writing. And recently, somebody called me who I had interviewed this woman's mother. And she, want, she was in her 40s, I believe, and wanted to become a writer. And um, I said, all right, every, every uh, type of interest that exists has websites devoted to it. Yeah. In fact, let's just look in the wrestling world. If you are a devotee of deathmatch wrestling, there are websites solely devoted to deathmatch wrestling. If you are a fan of the old Pacific Northwest wrestling territory, there are websites devoted just to that era. So if you want to be a writer, contact the people who run those websites. You're not going to get paid anything. But try your skills, you know, try writing an article, uh, you know, go on Instagram, you know, write six paragraphs every day about a topic that you love, you know, but don't think you've never been a writer and now you're going to write a book because that is a long, hard process. That's like saying, well, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to learn how to run the ropes and then I'm going to be main eventing WrestleMania. Y'all heard what the man said. He gave it to you. That's the bread and butter right there. Keith, before we get out of here, I want you to really give these guys a word. And I know we only scratched the surface of, of this book, but tell them why they need to pick this one up. Um, well, I think if you listen to this podcast, you'd have a pretty good idea. Look, it's something all of us have lived, lived through together as a community. We, uh, as a community of wrestling fans and as a community of human beings, we went through the COVID era together. And as wrestling fans, I think what I was feeling and experiencing and what the wrestlers were feeling and experiencing were all the same. We, the, the, all of that crosses over with, with all, everybody involved. And so even though it's an unpleasant era that people want to put into the rearview mirror, I think if you go back and um, read, read this stuff through, it might even bring up some pleasant memories, even if you're marveling at how bizarre it was to watch a WWE broadcast from a performance center with, you know, uh, trainees standing in a dark building behind plexiglass, it, it's almost like it didn't happen, but it's kind of fun reliving that now. And it, and it's not that long ago. Man, it, it, this is absolutely true. And it's amazing that you, you wrote this book because literally it was in my head the other day, like, man, we go about our life like it never happened, but it was just a real thing not too long ago. No, and everyone remembers it. <laughs> if you talk to a six-year-old, the six-year-old will remember it. Absolutely, man. Well, it's time for the very last segment of this show, and it's called Ring the Bell. What that is, I give you 60 seconds, but you can talk about anything. You can talk about your book. You can talk about wrestling. You can talk about what you ate this morning. You can talk about going to the gym two weeks from now, whatever you want to. But Keith, 
Elliot Greenberg. I want you to ring the bell. All right, here we go. Um, I guess I should talk about my book because I'm still trying to sell it. Um, you know, there were some very obscure promotions that are included in the book. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about AEW and WWE, but let's remember there were small promotions and not just in North America, but all over the world. You know, I uh, interviewed the uh, the promoter for a, a, a promotion in Finland who staged a, a show in an oil silo because you, you couldn't have it in a, an arena. So what would be cool? You'd have two guys go at it in an oil silo. And when you videotape that, there's, you know, this vibration that you hear and it makes for a very compelling wrestling match in an empty location. And this is a guy without a lot of money, but it's, it's a lot of creativity. You know, I interviewed a promoter in Denmark and the Danish wrestling scene is tiny. And, you know, th they weren't drawing that many fans to begin with. And then there were, he had to endure all these anxiety. Like if I'm getting 200 fans for a show, what's going to happen when this is over? Is anyone even going to be left? And so these are all people who deserve to be spotlighted because they are as devoted to wrestling as the guys we see on TV each week. And this goes back to the theme that I expressed earlier, the indies matter. Yes. Support your indie wrestling. You heard them. Support indie wrestling. All these guys you see on TV, they came from somewhere. Support them. You know, did you have a, a quick question? Did you have a prompt? Like, was it easy to get interviews with these guys or were some protective? Uh, it was fairly easy. Okay. You know, look, I have a track record. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, you know, I had a new book out. So it's not like people have, uh, were going to say, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> what have you done lately? You know, I started writing for Inside the Ropes magazine in the UK. Great magazine that, like your podcast, came out a newsstand wrestling magazine in the UK during the COVID era. During an era when people said, you know, print magazines are dead. This came out. So I was writing for them. I had that forum. I had just had a book out. And yes, guys spoke to me and women spoke to me. And I'm grateful for it. For sure. One time, let them know where they could get the book at. Uh, you can get the book anywhere where books are sold. You can get it at the bookstore. If there's a community bookstore that's the equivalent of the local indie promotion, I prefer you go there. Even if you have to, have to spend 2 or $3 more for it, support those local businesses. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it through ECW Press. You can get it pretty much on any website that sells books. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. And I got to tell you, one thing, and this is me telling you directly, you're such a real dude. I like that. For you to still say, people, go get it at the local mom and pop bookstore to help them as well. That's a really honorable thing, man. Salute to you for that. Well, thank you. But with that being said, guys, you heard the man. Get the book. It's an amazing read. It's a fun read. And if you're a pro wrestling fan, and I'm going to be honest, even if you're not a pro wrestling fan, this is a good read because it's going to take you on a nice journey understanding the world of wrestling during COVID because it applies to a lot of things that was in entertainment and sports. But and once again, the book is Follow the Buzzards, Pro Wrestling in the Age of COVID-19. You heard the man. Follow the Buzzards, Pro Wrestling in the Age of COVID-19. If you got any questions about it, hit me up or you can hit him up. Keep Elliot Greenberg. He's on Twitter. Tell him your Twitter and everything. I'm on Twitter. I just changed my Instagram because my other one got hacked. So it's Keith.E.Greenberg. And I'm on Facebook too, although I think I only have like 10 slots left for new Facebook <laughs> friends. I heard you said you, you got your, your Twitter hacked. You, did, you didn't get it back yet? Uh, no, I just started a new page. Oh, you didn't worry about it? Okay, I get it. I get it. Well, guys, once again, thank you very much for listening. Go get the book. It is a, once again, it's a great read. Check it out. 
and I will get with you guys next time. You know what it is. I am Deshaun Whip Dog Whipple, and I'm here with author, best-selling author, wrestling historian, Keith Elliott Greenberg, author of Fall of the Buzzards, pro wrestler, the age of COVID-19, and we're going to add a link so you get the book straight from his page. I will see you next time on the Wrestling Heroes and Insiders podcast, a.k.a. The Whip Show. Take care, guys. That was